Hello everyone, you're watching the IKE Aliens and you're on Aikido Italia Network with uh, Simone Gierke. And today my guest for this session is Christopher Lee. Uh, welcome to you, Chris. How are you doing? Oh, good. Good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, Chris, um, just to start to... to warm up the atmosphere. Could you mm -hmm. kindly give us an overview of your experiences in Aikido and Budo so far? Okay, uh, so let's see. I started Aikido in 1981. Uh, so I'm old, right? Uh, not as old as some people, but pretty old. Uh, let's see, I trained first on the US mainland with a I started with a student of Mitsuki Saltome, and uh, all my first ranks came from uh, Saltome, Saltome Sensei. And then uh, it's around, uh, well, in 82, I went to Japan for a, a short time, actually, after I'd first started Aikido. I think I was a uh, fifth Q. Uh, and I went with Yamada Sensei, which is another story, because Yamada and Saltome at the time were uh, not very friendly. They're probably not very friendly now either, but I, I'm kind of uh, apart from that now. Uh, and then uh, eventually, that was, that was uh, just for a short time, for about three months, and I trained at uh, Aikikai Hombu Dojo, knowing nothing at all as a Pikachu thrown into the mix, which was uh, fun, fun, but in, in retrospect, uh, I, I'm not sure I'd do it again. <laughs> uh, then in about, I think in 1989, I moved back to Japan after college, and uh, I ended up um, staying for a long time. Uh, I can remember altogether, maybe about 15 years. And um, then eventually I, I came back to Hawaii. So uh, during that time, I practiced mostly Aikido. Um, Aikikai, uh, also in Japan, I experimented a lot, Yoshinkan, Iwama. I did uh, a couple of different uh, forms of Daitoryu, uh, so Koryu, Fujitsu, um, coming back to Hawaii, I studied uh, some Chinese arts uh, as well. And then uh, since about 2010, I've been training with Dan Harden, if uh, anybody knows who Dan Harden is. Uh, some people are in, if they're in on the, if they're on the internet. Uh, some people, if they're off the internet, maybe have no idea. So I don't know. And uh, then in 2011, uh, we uh, started our own group, Aikido Sangenkai, and we've been training uh, since then. It's an Aikido group, but we uh, focus mostly around uh, Dan Harden's method of training. So it's maybe a little bit of, you know, unorthodox, uh, but, but we enjoy it. And uh, that takes up to the present. I think if you're on social media, you've probably seen me posting around. Uh, I have kind of an interest, interest in um, Japanese history, especially the history of Aikido uh, and that I kind of fell into that uh, on, on, through online discussions uh, in part because I started back, um, if anybody remembers Aikido L, it was an old uh, mailing list on a, a listserv for, for Aikido people, if people remember when people use listservs. Uh, and uh, we would talk about whatever, bullshit, mostly. <laughs> and, and argue a lot. This is a, and, uh, uh, it really interests me because I, I I, I follow more or less the same uh, footsteps, uh, right. the, the Aikido list, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the funny thing is that uh, today uh, there's a lot of people out there that refer to us uh, bloggers mm -hmm. as historian of Aikido, and that always <laughs> makes me laugh, you know, because like like yeah. some kind of Stanley Bryan's and maybe be more appropriate to call us Aikido communicators or something like that, you know. Uh, but th this yeah. question yeah. of yours uh, that I, mm -hmm. uh, I, feel, I feel the same, really. Mm -hmm. The question of yours for research in Aikido, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. 
oh, where does it come from? I don't know. I mean, we started discussing things. And then, um, you know, when I started, we didn't know any, right? nobody knew nothing about nothing, right? Um, I think Stan Pronin had um, a couple of those uh, Ike News magazines out and they looked like they were from a copy machine, right? Uh, so that was before he had the nice print edition. And there was some information coming out from that. There were a couple of books that weren't very good. Uh, John Stevens came out with his book uh, about uh, Shirata Sensei, and they had a short biography of um, uh, Murihiro Ishiba in the beginning. And at that time, we, we called it the biography of Murihiro Ishiba, that book, even though it's mostly just pictures of uh, Shirata Sensei techniques, because there really were no good biographies, right? So no detailed biographies. Uh, and then, of course, we'd talk on the internet, and then we'd talk, and I'd read more. I'd read more about Stan Pranen, and then uh, I really started getting into it more heavily when my Japanese got better. So when we moved to Japan, I think uh, the second time when my my wife's mother became ill, and we went back to Japan, and uh, my Japanese was getting better, and so I read uh, more Japanese. Um, uh, I started reading a lot of things. I was able to read the, a lot of uh, original sources and books on, you know, Aikido and other things that uh, I hadn't been able to read before. And uh, in, in combination with the online discussions, I guess that really got moving. Also, Stan Pranin, of course, was providing a huge uh, wealth of material uh, by that point. So there was just there was just more information, more things to dig into, right? Uh, we, we knew, you know, when I started, we didn't know anything about Daikotoryu. It was kind of one of those one of those many things that Murahiro Ishiba studied before he created his own original art in 1925. Right? Kishimoto used to say he created the art in 1925, and then uh, you know things things started to change. So, you know, as you dig into the, the, these things, you kind of develop a specialty. So I, I'm kind of a hobbyist with a specialty. I mean, if, if you want to call me a communicator or whatever. Uh, so that means I'm not, a, I'm not a historian, as you know, as some people call us historians. I, I'm, I'm a hobbyist, but I, I do, a, I'm a very specialized hobby. You see, hobbyists can all, often have a detailed knowledge. It's just they're not. It's not formal knowledge. There, there really are no historians in Aikido. Even Stan Pranin went to it because he went to Japan and started talking to people, right? And he wasn't a, a trained historian. He was sort of more of a, a recorder of history, right? He recorded all these interviews. He dug into these things. Um, the closest we have to a historian is maybe Peter Goldsbury, because he actually has some academic training. Uh, or maybe uh, Fumiaki Shishida, right, from uh, who's in uh, Shotokan Aikido, who's actually, a, you know, a, a professor who yes, sir, yes. uh, studies Budo, a Budo historian. But other than that, there really isn't anybody and nobody who really who does it full time or for a living, right? There are no scholarly works on Aikido, uh, except for uh, maybe Peter Goldsbury's essays and a, a couple of things in Japanese from Shishida of them translated into English, or one of his uh, students, uh, Kudo, uh, published a book uh, that's quite good on Aiki and uh, Aikido. Uh, and, that's, and that's really about it. So uh, there, there's a whole lot more information now uh, than we had before. And I think that that's what we get into trouble because uh, we get on the internet and uh, you still see some of the things that were, you know, Vogue 40 years ago, and, and uh, people uh, become very emotionally invested in these things. And so sometimes, in, a, uh, in a way, it was easier. Complex. It was easier in the past because we we knew nothing. And we did what we knew nothing. That's right. it. That's uh, right. Yeah. You you mentioned your uh, command of the Japanese language, and uh, this brings the the idea of an old movie, Lost in Translation. <laughs> That's right. Uh, a lot of your work has actually helped in clarifying how much of, uh, of what is attributed to Weshiba Morihei has very little to do with us and says true thinking. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's not hard to find quotes from Morihei that could be mm -hmm. used to support both sides of a different. <laughs> Could you elaborate a little on, on this and explain what has been done 
with uh, Weshiba Sensei's uh, legacy? Well, Morihei Ueshiba's speeches were very difficult, even in Japanese, right? So if you look at what most of his students said, most of his students said uh, that they difficulty understanding him. And this was in Japanese when they were sitting maybe right in front of him, listening it too directly, uh, you know, right, right into their ears. And they said they had difficulty understanding him. And um, part of that is because uh, apparently, he's, he had a very strong country accent, a Wakayama accent. Uh, there was one of his students, I think, uh, not Sunutama, Suganuma Sensei, I think. Suganuma Sensei said at one point that he, he couldn't understand half of what Morio Ishii was saying because the accent was so strong. Okay, well, that, that causes problems, right? And then the material looked very difficult. You know, he came out of a very complex background of uh, esoteric Buddhism and uh, Kototama and uh, Omkyo, and he really didn't believe in explaining things clearly for his audience, right? He spoke the way he was thinking of it. And um, when he spoke that way, it was, um, if you didn't have the correct background to understand what he was saying, uh, it was virtually impossible to understand what he was saying. And that's what most of the direct students said, uh, because they were mostly young people, right? And they would listen to him, and either they were, they weren't interested, most of them weren't interested, and they didn't have the background and they're difficult in understanding him. And then when he was um, recorded, because he, he actually wrote uh, very little, he wrote a few articles before the war for, um, for Budo magazines and for the, uh, the, the newsletter published by the uh, Budo Sen Yokai, which is the Omoto Kyo uh, Budo organization. Yeah, I think he actually wrote those directly. Um, but he wrote very little else, even um, the text that we have in uh, Budo, the 1938 manual, or the, uh, the 1933 Budo Renshu. Um, apparently, those texts were compiled by students, probably, probably Kenji Tomiki, right? Compiled texts. Um, after the war, we have quite a lot of uh, his speeches on record. Um, there, there's one collection uh, that's uh, collected in Aiki Shinzui that's mostly articles from the Aikido Shimba, right, the, the newsletter that was published by Aikai Hombu Dojo. And um, those were mostly recordings uh, done by um, Fujita Sensei and Arikawa Sensei, right? Uh, now, Moishiba hated to be recorded, so they kind of had to record him in secret and you know, hide the microphone uh, if they were recording him. Uh, so that caused difficulties with the quality of the recording. And then once they recorded them, then most of the transcriptions were done by Arikawa Sensei and Fujitsu Sensei. And they both said how difficult it was because of the quality of the recording and of the material. So were, they're, the, they're, <laughs> were the transcriptions edited or as far as you know, or just given the way they were? Well, Arikawa Sensei and Fujisa Sensei, I believe, um, tra transcribed them as faithfully as they could. Okay. Uh, I believe that after that, um, Stan Pranin always maintained that the uh, transcriptions were edited for publication in the uh, Aikido Shimbun, the Aikido newsletter. And from reading them, I believe that that to be the case. So they eliminated um, a lot of the religious language, right? A lot of the Omotokyo language a lot of the names of the gods and so forth. And um, that's often the way that he described things. So that's a difficulty. Also, I think they eliminated probably things that were uh, mm, not politically correct uh, yes. be published in, in, in the uh, Aikido newspaper. Uh, so you see some of those things in other speeches that were recorded outside of that. So you have some, uh, you, you, have, you have these sources which are edited. So they're not a hundred percent reliable. Um, and even, even if they were reliable, you'd have, you'd have difficulty, uh, I'm sorry, let's see, my computer wants to restart, but I'm not going to let it. So, um, even if they were not edited, you'd have difficulty understanding these sources, but they are edited. I know there's, um, a, a teacher in Japan, uh, Inui Sensei, he's uh, also studied Sensei's words quite a lot. And he has a long list of errors in transcription that he's found in Aiki Shinsui. Uh, some of them are minor, uh, some of them maybe not so minor. Um, 
The other source of, of, uh, that we have from Rui Hiroshiba is a book like a mosaic, it was published by the, uh, it was published by the Byako Shinko Kai. Uh, it's actually a set of, set of lectures that uh, Rui Hiroshiba gave um, specifically for patients. So he, he knew this was going to be published. Uh, and they were published in the Byako Shinko Kai newsletter originally. They were transcribed by Hideo Takahashi. And those I believe are much more accurate. Uh, first of all, because he specifically dictated those for, uh, for publication, and also because uh, Hideo Takahashi went back to Osensei and he'd uh, I consult with him, which I believe didn't happen with the, with the other uh, transcriptions that appeared in the Aikino newspaper. And um, yeah, so he'd go over various things to make sure that they were as accurate as they, they could be. So those are probably the most accurate transcriptions we have. Uh, those don't exist in English. Uh, except in a very heavily edited fashion. Uh, there, there is a, a, a their translation into French. I'm not sure how good it is because I studied French in high school, but that's all gone. That's you know 40 years ago. Uh, the, in, the English translation, there's one, it's by John Stevens. And when, when I talked to him about it, he called it Takamuso IT Light because he edited it heavily. He, he said yeah. he removed so the lines. Th the that's the problem. The, the, the mm -hmm. other problem is that uh, uh, a text that is already extremely comp complex by yeah. has been transcripted by other people right. or right. other sources in, in Japanese. And then yeah. being given to other people to translate in their own languages. With that's right. The, right. with the relative filters, because this is where yes. I wanted to go. So we now Westerners read all about the philosophy of the founder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, how much of what we're reading is actually the philosophy of the founder? That's right. So it's very difficult to tell because any translation is never going to be accurate, a hundred percent, right? It's never like reading the original. And if, if you're looking at the Bible, Right. Uh, so you're reading the Bible. I can go out and I can pick up 30 different translations of the Bible. Right. So it's possible for me to compare. Right. That I can look at the different translations. I can pick up the original Greek or the Hebrew. Uh, if I speak Greek or Hebrew, it's all publicly available. Right. There are scholarly books and articles about the translations and about the text of the Bible. So it's possible for me to evaluate it. Right. I can look at the, any given passage from the Bible and see what I think might be the most accurate translation. But that's not possible with Muruhio Ishiba. Usually there's one translation, uh, mostly by John Stevens. And that's not saying that those are bad necessarily. But if you have one translation and no reference, you have no idea whether it's accurate or not, yes. especially if it's out of context. Nothing to compare it to. That's right. Yes. That's right. And the most popular translation uh, generally in the West for English speakers is The Art of Peace, right, from John Stevens, which is, you know, a selection of out of context quotations from various sources. Some of the sources are reliable, some of them aren't. Nobody really knows because the sources aren't cited right? and there's no context given. So it's like um, if, you, if you have them in Italy, I don't know if in the US they have a Bible quote a day calendar. That you can put on your desk. It has one yeah, well, quotation uh, from the Bible uh, for each they're perfect. day. They're perfect for social media. Now you, you stick a photo of the found That's right. and uh, a quote, right. and uh, whoever has put the, the post out looks good. <laughs> that, that, that's really that's right. That's right. No more than that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very complicated issue. So, what should be a very complex discussion, right? What did he say? Uh, what did it mean? It becomes a meme on the internet. And then uh, a lot of people believe that that quote is accurate. So the, you, you get into problems. I know I say get into problems on the internet when I talk too much, right? But uh, you get into problems because people become very heavily invested in that well, particular the, quotation. Those people that get idea. very angry, very angry. Yes. You get insulted. You get insulted by, right. by, by, by people on social media. If you, if you dare, yeah. look, maybe. The story is not exactly as clear as you think, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people, you know, people love their teachers, which I understand, right? Everybody loves their teacher. Their teacher said something, uh, they saw something on the internet, right? They're very emotionally involved in it. 
uh, you know, I understand that, but it's not necessarily the truth, right? Um, uh, if you're interested in it, I mean, it may, it may not be. I, I've had people say to me, well, I don't know if it's true or not. I, I, like, I like the idea behind the quote. It's like okay. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, Fair enough. Fine. You know, it's. <laughs> um, but you know, there there are really two discussions, or there should be two discussions, right? One is history, right, which is all um, should be a, a, as objective as possible, as true as possible, right? That's what actually happened, right? What someone said, what they did, where they went. Okay, that's one. And then there's what we do, right? Our training, our practice. And where the two mix together, sometimes there are a lot of problems. Yeah, they should get. Um, they, should be, they should be very well separated. That's the that's the fact. They should be separated, right? Right, because people can do whatever they want. I, I don't care. I mean, I do whatever I want in my training. You know, people like it, they don't like it. I don't care. You know, it's what I enjoy. And people can do, of course, what they like. You know, they're free to do it. That's fine. Um, get mixed together. Basically, I find three things happen. Right, there's. Um, they, 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 history is used for uh, authenticity, right? Which is a big thing in all traditional martial arts. Uh, in Asian martial arts is very common that people want to be authentic, right? So they use the history to justify their particular lineage, their, you know, their teacher's credentials, right? And um, part of that's because uh, there's no competition in Aikido, right? So a boxer doesn't have to defend his authenticity because he gets up and he boxes and it's his authenticity, right? So he doesn't say, oh, my boxing is the original boxing from Coach Bob, right, who taught me, you know, and I was his student for 10 years, whatever. It's totally right? so, irrelevant. Right, it's totally irrelevant, right? The, other, the second thing that happens is justification, right? The justification for what you're doing. And that's also partially because there's no competition, right? So I do this because my teacher said so, right? Or the history says, so, oh, sensei said so. And Morihei Oshiba believed this, therefore I believe this, therefore what I'm doing is good, right? So it's my justification. And then the third thing that happens is authority, right? So people, uh, exert their authority by appeal to the past. And usually that's cherry picked part of the past. Um, they pick some part of something that some teacher said, and now that's the rule for uh, forever, right? Maybe for all eternity. Uh, if you remember, not last year, it was pre COVID. So uh, I want to say two years ago, maybe there were some Russian Aikikai groups that were practicing a very light form of competition, not really direct head on sparring, but I think they were doing, um, you know, like forms with prizes. And the Aikikai sent out a letter, uh, Mitsuteru Iwashiba sent out a letter uh, under the heading of the Aikikai. And one of the things they said was that, you know, competition is forbidden in Aikido. It is the immutable will of the founder. It's immutable, right? It can never be changed. And by the yeah. way, uh, forgetting that there's plenty of competitions in, in Aikido, not in Aikikai Aiki, Aikido, but in, not in Aikikai, right? In other yeah. styles, there's plenty of it under different forms, and uh, it's not a scene. Right. It's not a scene, as you said, uh, as you said earlier. Uh, I train the way I like. No, that's right. Yeah, Why not to so, compete. But people want to exert their authority, uh, and th this is a big thing for the Aikikai. This particular issue. I know a competition, I think, because they chose it early on as a way of differentiating Aikido uh, from, from perhaps other arts in the, in the post-war era. Uh, even, even though originally, you know, not competing is kind of the, the standard, right? In Worihei Oibushi's Oishiba's time, right? Of course, there's no competition in Daito Ryu. Uh, Gichin Funakoshi was opposed to sporting competition in the beginning. Right. He, he, of course, yeah, they had a form of sparring, randori in judo, but he was uh, initially opposed to sporting competition. Kichin Funakoshi was always a competition. Um, even competition in kendo was kind of a new thing, right? It came about in the uh, Meiji period with Gekiken and then evolved into kendo. But it was a kind of a new idea, this sporting competition in uh, Japanese sword. So it used to be that everybody thought that way. And then, but after the war, I guess the, the sporting aspect was the most common. And I think that uh, the Aikikai kind of grabbed it as a, uh, as a marketing point, right? 
we are the martial art without competition. What an unusual idea, except that it, it didn't used to be unusual. It's only unusual now. And of course, now they can't back down from that, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, well, the mats are actually are packed. The Aikido mats are packed with people that are busy looking wise with someone else's book in, in their. <laughs> so we've seen it for for years. Um, yes. So it's just that it shouldn't be that a teacher should teach something that makes sell makes uh, sense in itself without having to refer to an external authority to justify it. How, how did yeah, we get there? That's right. How did we get there? You know, that I, it's very common. It's very common in all traditional martial arts, I think. Well, it's, right, it's a sign of weakness, though. It's a si sign of weakness. Yes. And by the way, our um, beloved Morihei Ueshiba, as far as I know, Never quoted Sokaku Takeda. Never. Never. Not so far as I know. Not so far as I know. So I, it didn't I think need... he ever even quoted uh, Deguchi, you know, when he said it, when he spoke in that language. So he didn't, he didn't quote him. It's funny enough because we always refer to the founder, but uh, often enough we, we forget to follow what he was doing, you know? That's, <laughs> he, right. That's right. He was doing his thing, right or wrong, it doesn't matter. As you said, it's my thing. You like it, right. I don't like it. It's your, it's your decision. But I don't need to right. uh, do it and, and then say, oh, no, that's fine. Because, for example, I am uh, mm -hmm. of uh, Tada, Fujimoto, and Hosokawa and say, I oh, know. I do this because it, my master, my, my sensei is, I've done it. I do it, right. I do it. Of course, I, I learn from them. And I- Right, right, of course, yeah. One has to be honest uh, and recognize our teachers, their, their due. But that said, we shouldn't, we shouldn't use it to justify maybe, as if we often see things that our teachers never said and never did. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So it's very tempting, I think, to use because it's hard. It's hard to contradict an authority, especially Murihei Ueshiba, right? So if Daikikai says, "Well, this was the will of Murihei Ueshiba," well, you can't contradict that because he's dead, right? You can't go back to him and say, "Sensei, did you really say that?" Right? Uh, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, I know I've seen dojos where students try to invoke the authority of the teacher. And then another student would go back to the teacher and say, well, is, is, is this what you want us doing? And the teacher would say, no, what, what, are, you, what are you talking about, right? So, uh, but th in this case, it, you can never go back to Murihei Ueshiba because he's passed away. And he lived in a different time, you know, a different context, different culture, right? He, he didn't believe in competition. Uh, you know, he, he said that pretty clearly, which is fair enough. Uh, you know, some people don't like competition. You know, some people do, that's fine. Uh, in his time, it was very common, but of course, times change, right? Because he did one thing, uh, you know, it's not necessarily true that we should be doing that, you know, forever. And of course, very nobody really trains like Maria Hoshiba anyway, right? Yeah. Uh, although yeah. some people believe that they may be. But also, I don't think that's... also, I think we're doing lots of things that Maria Hoshiba wouldn't like to see done in the name of course. No. so it's a yeah. it's a very weak point uh, staying with this uh, argument over the years i heard it said several times that also mm -hmm. have left an aikido system where you always have tori and duke and when taking mm -hmm. me you would have to accept what was doing the technique does and uh, osensei would have left this aikido system to remove uh, selfishness, to eliminate the ego. But I could never, in my research anyway, I could never find anywhere where that is actually being said by Morihei Ueshiba. Do you, have you ever come across any documental proof of this or is it uh, another modern interpretation of Aikido that has little to do with the founder and its legacy. I've never found any support for that directly. I know a couple of Murihei Oishiba students have said things like that. I'm uh, suspicious of those kind of statements. Uh, in, J in Japan, 
uh, also in the but in Japan there there's there's uh, often things that are not spoken about right they're not discussed or you, you never ask the teacher why he's doing that they're sensei you know, what, what, what's the deal why are you doing that why why would you do that right nobody says that the sen teacher does it and then you follow right you imitate um, so th there's a tendency in Japan to kind of invent a reason after the fact for many things. And you see it not just in Tokyo, but many, many different facets of Japanese life. So they have the, some kind of practice. And then after the fact, they invent some kind of reasoning around it. Oh, well, we do that because whatever, whatever, whatever. But what really happened, maybe someone just did it for some random reason uh, or some other reason completely. And nobody really knows, but they, they made this up. Um, that uke -nage thing, I mean, it, it, it's the standard way of training in Daitoryu. They train exactly the same way. You know, Morihei Yoshiba used it, you know, Daitoryu used it. If you get most classical mar Japanese martial arts, most uh, jujitsu, uh, you look at things like Katori Shintoryu, which is maybe the oldest martial tradition, it's still uke -nage, right? They have, it, it's still that same exact role playing, right? someone takes a turn in uh, as this role and then they in turn they become a, a turn in the other role so there's no reason for me to believe that it's specially created for for that purpose right it's it's just the standard way of training that exists in all these martial arts that had no form of training through sparring uh through kind of randori training which was really came about more in the modern area uh, i mean it existed somewhat in in arts, but uh, like Jigoro Kano brought in Randori, uh, Kendo brought in Randori became more common. Uh, I think people who are trying to rationalize it that way are trying to contrast it to things like Judo and Kendo, really just modern systems, right? So Judo and Kendo re really have the most modern kind of training system. Aikido is just using the same old system that Murihei Oishiba got from Daitori. Right? It's, it seems to me that it's exactly the same. I don't want to say the teacher is lying, but <laughs> we won't get there. Uh, let's now consider how the Western way of thinking has caused um, a dichotomy in the way we think about power. Uh, we always refer to internal and external power as almost as separate entities with separate methods also. To okay. them. Is this the? Is it true, first of all, that these two things are separate? And uh, by any chance, is this the origin of all the foggy, exoteric theories of on how to achieve mastery in Aikido? Uh, <laughs> as, far, as far as I remember, Aikido is, is just one. That's what we maintained the whole time. So how come that there's different ways, you know, external, internal, etc. I know that you dedicated a lot of time to this research and I'll, I'd love to, to get mm. your opinion on this. Well, um, internal, external uh, dichotomy really comes from China, from Chinese martial arts, mainly. I think it was primarily used there. And Chinese martial artists, artists argue about this all the time. So I'm going to say there's any one uh, standard definition of external and internal, right? Um, my view on it is that uh, it, for, if we're looking at Chinese martial arts or and then carrying that over to Japan, that uh, internal and external divisions were largely artificial, right? They're, we're talking about different ways of classifying training methodologies that are generally different, right? So the two different, generally different kinds of training methodologies, uh, an external kind and an internal kind. Uh, but other than that, the, the division itself is, is uh, artificial, right? It's all, um, if we cut through the uh, classical topic, we're talking about key and all that kind of thing. Um, basically, everything has to be biomechanical, physical, Right, everything has to be biological. There's really no way way of getting around that. Uh, for external arts, external arts, if we're talking, um, uh, generally you're talking about 
uh, an art that's training uh, in relation to another person. So you're talking about leverage, uh, you're talking about speed, timing, strength. And if you're talking about an internal martial art, you're talking about some kind of training that is uh, happening relative to oneself. So you're talking about how you handle your body, how you control your body, how you manage incoming force, how you generate outcoming force. That's all relative to you rather than the re relationship between you and uh, the other person. So if you look at Daitoryu, for example, uh, some schools of Daitoryu uh, divide the curriculum into three, right? Uh, Jujutsu, uh, Aiki Jujutsu, and Aiki no Jutsu, right? So Jujutsu it would be the external components, right? That's the leverage, the, uh, the wrist locks, uh, timing, angles, speed, uh, all those things that happen in relationship with another person. Uh, the Aiki no Jutsu, and this is, gets a little fuzzy uh, because there's also a set of techniques. It's called Aiki no Jutsu, but Aiki no Jutsu talking about um, training, more internal training, right? Training that's happening relative to yourself, how you're managing your body, how you're managing uh, uh, force incoming with your body, right? How you're managing to generate outgoing force. And then Aiki Jujutsu would be uh, somewhere in the middle, right? A combination of when you're doing Jujutsu with an Aiki body, maybe, uh, where you're using uh, Aiki in your body to power your Jujutsu. So they, they, they would divide it like, roughly into, into three, three, three pillars, right? Uh, O-sensei later uh, in, in Iwama, he, he tried to divide things differently, right, into uh, you know, into a hard training, right? Kotai training and Rutai training, Jutai training, Kitai training. Um, I think some somewhere along the uh, similar similar line of thing, but it was more also more related to the uh, you know the, the the type of the, the character of the training that was uh, that was occurring. So um, I mean, there there you you can get into a lot of very funny areas when people are talking about internal energy key. Uh, and I think it's important to, if you get into that kind of a conversation, to try and define what you're talking about, because I find that most of those conversations go I'll downhill because uh, go downhill because people aren't defining their terms, right? Yeah. So people say they say Aiki is this or is this, and the other person says no Aiki isn't that or Ki isn't that, but then no nobody says right up at the head of the conversation what they're talking about, what they mean by Aiki or what they mean by Ki or you know how we're going to drill down in, into that kind of term so uh if if we're going to have those conversations where we get into a more esoteric manner then it's important to define what we're talking about uh, do, does that answer your question i don't know Goes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay well uh let's stay with with this i think uh, okay. uh, it's kind, uh, kind of a trendy topic uh, lately you know mm -hmm. there's a really there's a hyper exposure of aiki on contemporary social media mm -hmm. not yeah. i don't know if you've seen it but not a day goes by without a, a new video being published with people showing real or presumed aiki powers what is going on uh, <laughs> Everyone figured out uh, the I the IQ faculty all at once, or what is it? It's just a, it's is it a fashion now, or perhaps you know there's there's more video around of people who you know did things and used to not release video, uh, like Koto Horikawa. When I was starting, there was no video of Koto Horikawa, you know the Kodokai. Uh, uh, Sego Okamoto put out some some videos. Uh, let's see, when when did I go see him in Japan? I think that was 1989. So it must have been around that time, I guess the 80s, when the those started they started to come out with some videos of that. Uh, maybe the late 80s. Um, yeah, there were there was there were kind of a lot of discussions on uh, Aiki Web and on Aikido L surrounding internal power with um, Darren and Mike Sigmund and a lot of other people. And that's really how I kind of got drawn into, I want to say drawn into this, but because we, 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 when uh, you know Dan Harden and Sigmund first came on, I guess uh, 
Mm, that was on Aikido L that they first started talking. Uh, but I thought they were all full of crap, right? Uh, <laughs> Dan would come on and say whatever. And um, he, he very rarely edited whatever he posted uh, on uh, to the to the mailing list, and he, he still doesn't edit what he what he says. Uh, he's much more coherent in person if if you met him. And then uh, Mike Sigmund would come on and say, "Well, everything comes from China, right?" Uh, he's mainly Mike Sigmund's mainly a uh, a Chinese martial artist, right? So he said this all comes from China, and would say, "Well, of course it doesn't. No, no, you know, there's no connection to China." Of course, when you start digging into Chinese, uh, Japanese culture and history, it all comes from China, right? So the references back to China are absolutely present. If you start digging into Japanese martial traditions, uh, the Haitians and the, re the, uh, the relevance back to Chinese classical martial texts are all, all apparent, but at the, at the time we just, we didn't believe them. And then um, I think through the uh, starting, let's see, when we first around 2010, uh, those people started uh, teaching more publicly, right? They started holding seminars. Uh, we had we had some out here, and then uh, that kind of thing became more widespread. Some people are teaching more openly. Uh, Roy Goldberg from Daito Ryu is teaching more openly. Maybe that encourages both to uh, both real and perhaps imagined. Uh, to come forward and try and uh, you know jump on the bandwagon uh, and uh, see if they can pull something from that. I'm, I'm not sure that it's enti entirely that profitable to do that kind of thing. I, I think uh, like Dan and Mike, I don't think they've really made any serious thing out of this. You know, um, uh, I don't know anyone who's really making money out of traditional martial arts these days, in case, except yeah. for maybe some of the big dogs. You know, I'm. I'm sure the Doshu makes money, uh, right? Uh, you know, Doshu, Waka Sensei make money, right? But um, outside of that, you know, I, I think there are very few people who are really making a profit. Even even some of the big organizations like Yamada Sensei, like in the USAF, people like that. I, I you know, I, I'm sure they make a living. But it's not, I don't, it's as profitable for them even as it was back in, say, the 1980s when things were really booming, you know. Well, it's also, it's not only money, I suppose uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, status. Um, yeah, that's true. Uh, that's true, only... right. People want a, a certain status, you yeah. know. So the, the guy next door can can prove that he has the, the, the IT faculty, he feels, you know, and you don't. You know, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's right. That's something that always uh, irritates me, that it's not the fact that... Uh, one has it or doesn't, but it's the fact that they immediately start to ask the others, do you have it? <laughs> you know, right. you know, you know, you're the silly one that cannot do this. Anyway, so let's say, let's stay with this for another little while. Okay. In your opinion, in um, in contemporary society, is <laughs> is it more useful to study Aiki Do? What basically where the final objective is to control and applicate the, the Aiki faculty or to study Aikido, the way, in a few words, the way traced by Doshu Ueshiba Kishomaru that has moved the art of Aikido within the realm of the, the, the how would you call them, the psychodynamics and the relational practices? What, what is it, yeah. what's more useful in these days? Well, useful is a trick tricky word because it depends what, what's useful for that individual person. Um, if someone comes to me and they say, I, I want to study self-defense, I would tell them not to study any traditional martial art. Uh, I, I don't think it's worth the time, right? Most people in the United States, some countries are more dangerous or some people have professions where it's required. Most people in the United States, um, the chances that they'll die uh, in the next year uh, from injuries inflicted, inflicted by somebody else are about half of the chances that they'll from injuries inflicted by themselves, right? That they'll commit suicide or hurt themselves in some way. 
So, I mean, if you think it that way, you know, rather than studying martial arts, you should go out and go to a psychologist and have some count, right? That's a better use of your money and your time. Uh, so for me, um, people who are training, you know, for martial purposes, unless that's your profession or you live in, in a more dangerous area than I do, uh, it's not really worth your time. You know? um, but people do all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons, right? People surf there's absolutely no usefulness to surfing, right? Uh, but people do it every day, right? People do pottery, right? And they're, they're well, I mean, I guess there's some usefulness well, to pottery. Chris, but, uh, <gasps> surfers, surfers will tell you that it's a way of life. It's a way of life, that's right, yeah. that's right. People, people love it, right? They surf yeah. their entire lives, they surf every day, and that, that's fine, you know, they find it useful, but other people say, well, what good is surfing gonna do me, right? So, I mean, whatever is useful, I think, is what you enjoy, you know, make, what makes your life better. Um, I, I'm, as I say, we kind of focus on the, this in, internal, internal power training uh, method that uh, was it's being taught by Dan Harden. Um, and I, try, I focus on that because it's interesting, right? It's more interesting than other things. Um, and that's fine. I'm not saying it's better than any other approach, right, or more useful. It's more interesting for me and I enjoy it. Some people I may enjoy competing, right? They go into BJJ and they enter tournaments or something. And maybe that's useful and enjoyable for them. That's fine. A lot of people do BJJ and never compete, right? So, you know, it all there. A lot of people do regular good old Aikikai Aikido, which is kind of a group social activity these days for most people, right? You go out and you have some exercise, you meet your friends and um you enjoy yourself and i think that's that's great too you know that's use, useful for that yeah you know. so again as we if we go back there's this there's a, a different conversation right so you, we had the one conversation was the history right uh, well then another conversation of what we do maybe a third conversation is how useful something is right and why it's useful right but I, I don't think it something necessarily has to be useful. In order to be, you know, in order to be worth training, unless you're you're doing it for your profession, right? So if I'm uh, military or I'm uh, law enforcement, I'm uh, working uh, in, uh, you know, a mental hospital someplace where I have to deal with violent people, uh, then of course, right? Then then it becomes a question of perhaps of you know what which approach is going to be most useful to me. Uh, but other than that. I don't, I don't think it really applies. I mean, we can talk technically, and I think that's, that's a valid way to have discussions too, right? Uh, you know, if you're talking about a certain situation, well, in this situation, uh, maybe it's tactically more, strategically more advantageous to go to the ground or to use this technique or to use that tactic. Uh, I think those are all great discussions, but then those also become uh, mixed in, right? A technical discussion becomes mixed in with other discussions of, well, is it authentic, or uh, you know, is it better than this, right? It's, uh, it's what we're doing, right? So it's uh, part of my justification. Right? People uh, often criticize Aikido because they say, well, it's not effective or it's not useful, right? or someone brags about their Aikido because our Aikido is more useful. Right, it's more useful than your Aikido because it's it's uh, real Aikido. Well, uh, actually, there is a style of Aikido called real Aikido, uh, but it's more useful for something or other, right? So, and th those are all technical discussions that are that are that are fine, but I think they're not necessarily uh, they don't necessarily translate between them uh, depending upon their 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 particular goals. Okay, thank you. Um... Chris, I'm gonna ask you something that I asked uh, to Alice Andur in our mm -hmm. view two weeks ago. And <laughs> the question is, uh, has Morihei Weshiba cloned Daito Ryu as they always maintained on that side of the fence? Or mm -hmm. has he completely reshaped it and tr transcended its uh, original meaning as they taught us Aikido people say. Hmm. Okay, so not second one. And not really the first one either, although that would be much closer. So when I started, the, the conversation was basically, 
that Murihei Ueshiba studied all of these different arts, of which um, Daichiru maybe one if you heard about it, and then started his own art about 1925. And Kishimoto Ueshiba always used to say that the you know, Aikido started around 1925. I think the Aikikai still maintains that more or less. Uh, and then what I see today is that um, because primarily what Stan Parman brought up, right, all the information about Daichiru, it turned out that, you know, before the war, you know, the pre-war students said, well, yeah, we, we were doing Daichiru, right? Kenji Tomiki said, yeah, I studied Daichiru, Aiki Jujitsu. And, uh, you know, Minori Muchizuki said, yeah, look, I have a Daichiru scroll. Isamu Takeshita had a Daichiru scroll. Um, well, there's some funny business with that, but we can talk about that later if you want to. Uh, uh, so Stan Pranen brought up all this information. And then uh, now when I talk to people today, it seems that the talking point is that, okay, he studied Daichiru before the war, but after the war, it transformed into something completely different. Uh, and if, I don't really buy that argument either, right? Because technically what is before the war and after the war were not, not so different. And uh, that was something that Mori, uh, Morihiro Saito used to always stress when he walked around those hours carrying that damn book, right? And carrying Budo in his arm when he taught seminars and he'd say, look, 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 this is what the founder taught me in, in Iwama. And here he is in 1938 doing the same thing, right? To prove that he was doing the same thing as Murihiro Ishiba. But in 1938, of course, it was Daitori, right? So if it's Daitori in 1938, then when Murihiro Ishiba was in Iwama in 1968, right? It's still technically Daitori. Um, even in Daitori, there, there's a lot of variation, right? Yeah. Kodohodakawa and Takumahisa were very, very different. Uh, Yuki Yoshi Sagawa was very different. Uh, you had all these people doing different things and taking things into different areas. Uh, and Murihei Ueshiba was one of those Daitori students, right? So he, he certainly had his own spin on, he certainly changed things. But then the question you have to ask is, um, and this is where it always becomes difficult, is where does one thing become another thing, right? So he was certainly a Daitori teacher. Uh, change? No, sorry. Some things changed, right? But uh, did he ever change it into something completely different? Like today I'm doing boxing, but then uh, you know, 20 years from now you see me and I'm doing yoga, right? Okay, well, we could say maybe those are completely different things, right? Uh, but today I'm doing boxing, 20 years from now uh, you come see me and I'm, I'm doing something that I'm not calling boxing, but it, it looks very, very, very identical. Well, then is that something completely different? It would be difficult to say that. So I think there really was no clear line where we could say that Murihei Ueshiba taught something. He, he, when he, uh, technically, of course, uh, things were very similar. We can now compare on video and film that what he was doing in 1935 was almost identical to what he was doing in 1965. Um, and even after the war in 1957, he himself said that he was heir to the art of the Takeda family, said there were 2,664 techniques uh, in Aikido in 1957. This was years after he told Morihiro Saito that he had perfected Aikido uh, in Iwama, right? So 2,664 techniques, well, that's not quite what most people, most people say 2,884, right? And, and, in Daitaru, but it, it really varies depending on who you're talking to. But he was really saying things, right? He never himself really distinguished, I think. And we know that in 1960, he was still giving out Daitaru certificates, uh, both Gozo Shioda and Kenji Tomika, Kenji Tomiki, uh, excuse me, uh, gave demonstrations in the 1950s where they, uh, yeah, they called what they were demonstrating Daitaru Yuaiki Jiu Jitsu. So it, there's, it's all mixed together. There really is no clear dividing line, I think, to say that he uh, you know, created something new and different. No, of course he had his own take on it. You know, if you look at what he did, it's different than what Koto Hodakawa was doing. I'm sure it's different from the other people, but not so different, I think you could call it something new. I mean, he invited, after the war, he invited uh, uh, Yukiyoshi Sugawa to teach at Aikikai Hombu Dojo. 
by, for example, who was a, a famous dietary instructor. So he thought it was close enough what was happening in Hombu, or maybe what should have been happening in Hombu, uh, to have Sagawa teach there. Of course, it fell through. It never happened, but um, it could have happened, and things would probably be, might have been very interesting, <laughs> very different, but it could have happened. So I think if, you, if you're trying to postulate that he created something completely different, it's very, it's extremely cool. I think it's a very well, hard case to make. He never, he never said that uh, other people yeah. have been saying it and someone is actually still yeah. uh, still going around with this kind of spiel. Um, yeah. Maybe the, the real innovator, if we want to find an innovator here, was his son. Yes. Yeah. I think Kishimoto Oishiba is really responsible for Aikikai Aikido today, which is most of Aikido, right? And um, that, that was a great achievement. I mean, you know, he, he really hated something um, kind of, uh, you know, a more modern version. And, and he said in the interviews that was done with him, he said it himself, that it was intended to be a more modern version that people couldn't train the way his father did anymore. Uh, you know, so he created an art that's um, enjoyed by millions of people, right? Uh, it's kind of a group social activity, which people hate to hear me say sometimes. Uh, but it, it's, it's a great thing. Uh, sometimes I've compared modern Aikido and Morihio Ishiba's Aikido to ballet and Zumba, uh, which I, I know people get angry about sometimes because they think I'm trying to criticize modern Aikido. Uh, but if you look at Zumba, Zumba is about 100,000, a million times more popular than ballet, right? No, nobody wants to do ballet for normal people, right? Ballet is extremely difficult. Uh, it hurts. It requires a lot of dedication and training. Uh, nobody wants it. You don't see people flocking to ballet classes, right? Except for little kids, right? They send their kids to ballet classes. Zumba is popular, right? It's fun. Uh, there are Zumba classes everywhere, or things like Zumba. Maybe Zumba is out of fashion now. I don't know. I'm older, so I'd have to ask younger people. But um, those kind of exercise classes, uh, Zumba or spinning or whatever it is, it's fun, right? It's fun. You get to go with your friends and uh, meet people and have a good experience. And it's about a million times more popular than, than Aikido, right? So that's something like what Kishimoto Ushiba, uh created, right? He kind of reworked the philosophy uh, a little bit as much as there was philosophy. But now it's uh, a kind of a more modern um you know, conflict resolution, getting along with other people, uh, creating, uh, you know, uh, communities and world peace uh, kind of philosophy, which um, sold very well through the, you know, the 70s and the early 80s. Uh, I don't know how well it sells these days, but I guess it's still popular with a large segment of the population. But uh, I think it's a great thing. You know, people like it, they enjoy it. I think that's great. Well, we were talking about translating earlier on. Yeah. That's what he, he has done. Uh, we're not here to judge uh, right or wrong, but he's translated something that was, in your own words, extremely complicated to figure out, even for the students of, the, of his father. He translated it yeah. something right or wrong that actually managed to, to be in the reach of millions of people. So th there's no discussion that he was that's right, that's right. genius in, in his own way. Yeah. That's um, right. well, and, and a lot of it was unintended, I think. You know, he changed a little bit at a time and things as they change, they take on their own life, right? They change in unexpected ways. Yeah, you know, like uh, Kishimoto, I thought was always very clear that Aikido was Budo, right? He, he, he was clear that it was a martial art, there was a martial side. And I think he himself is more skilled maybe than some than people often give him credit for, although in comparison to other people, perhaps not so not so skilled. Uh, but then, you know, of course, things shifted away from that as he, as he changed. You know, he, he, he was kind of flying by the seat of his pants, so to speak, right? He changed things, uh, you know, really knowing what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's change subject uh, now. Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, are gradings and rank a necessary evil in Aikido? No, uh, it's obvious that it, it is necessary to have 
some kind of system to uh, knowledge, um, mastery in its different levels. But Chris, do, we, do you think that we really need to purchase four, five, six, seven times expensive postal certificate of mastery over our, our Aikido career? I, I don't think so. <laughs> what does, I don't think so either. <laughs> what does that get to do with Aikido? Also, to be honest, I never heard of a, a six down violinist. <laughs> you know? That's right. That's right. Uh, uh, there are so only it's um, good yeah. and bad it, it's it. and the, yeah. the the judge of that is the the quality of their art and uh, how right. their art is perceived by others and that also yeah. connects with what we we're, we were saying earlier about the this continuous uh, calling the the legacy. Uh, of our uh, predecessors to justify what we do while our art should be the only right, thing right. that should be judged. Right, right, so right, right. why do you think that Aikido people love uh, color belts and certificates and okay. diplomas, very good boy badges so much? <laughs> well, everybody does, don't they? I'm, I'm yeah. waiting for my 10th my Daniel. So yeah, someday, right? So I'll... I mean, it, it was a scheme to, to market the art after the war, basically speaking, right? So there were no ranks before the war. And then the Daini Hombutokukai, which was mandated by the government to control all martial arts, started requiring Don ranks. And then before the, uh, very, very, very shortly before the war ended. And then uh, that's when Murihe Ueshiba handed out. Uh, a number of Don ranks, like he gave an eighth Don to Kenji Tomiki and so forth. Uh, then after the war, everybody was using Don ranks, right? So they used it to spread the art. Um, it's, uh, I mean, today, I mean, there's really no meaning to it today, right? There's no, it, it's an income stream for the Aikikai, right? And maybe for the organizations, depending on how they handle the promotions. Um, but there's no regulation. Of it, it's they're all it's all a, a diploma mail, right? You you send in your money and they send back certificates. I know I've I've done that many, many times um, in Hawaii. We, we you know when we send in promotions, they have no idea who we're sending in, right? They don't know, right? So you, they just stamp it. You know, some nice secretary in Hombu office stamps it with Doshu's uh, Doshu's Hanko, and uh, then mails it back after they get the money, right? So there's there's no real meaning to it. Uh, in terms of rank, I mean, there, there's perhaps some reading in your local organization, right? You you get it from the instructor and so forth, but there's no standards for it. Um, if it were, you know, a degree from uh, an institution of higher learning or at a university or something, um, it would never pass accreditation, right? They have accrediting standards to make sure that degrees have some uh, objective standard of testing and certification. And that's not perfect either, but there is some, some regulation. So there, there's really no meaning to that in terms of, you know, what, what they're giving out. And then there's the question of, um, you know, whether you need ranks at all, right? Uh, they originally started with Jigoro Kano, right? Because his idea was to bring um, judo into the educational system, right? Into public education. And they, they work great for kids, right? You know, so they, they kind of, uh, my, when my daughter took swimming classes in Japan, uh, they used uh, Q ranks, right? So they had, uh, each Q had a different set of swimming tasks, right? You could swim 20 meters, swim three, 30 meters, uh, swim underwater for so far. So it broke a uh, difficult task down into, uh, into understandable chunks or achievable uh, portions. And, um, but you know, nobody went, went around saying, hey, I'm a third Q in swimming, right? There was no status attached to it. It just made it very, um, you know, very achievable, very reasonable. For adults, there doesn't seem to be any real purpose put to it for me. I mean, if you look at things like, uh, you yeah, know, violin, right? Or golfing or surfing, right? There are no ranks, right? Okay. Uh, especially in, you know, you know, yeah. You know, it's uh, whatever, you're just doing it. I mean, I can say for an, an organization, perhaps as an organization you want to, maybe perhaps you want to certify your instructors, 
I, I can see there might be a reason for that. You want to certify that they have certain qualifications. I know in England, for example, you have to be certified in, I think, CPR and certain kind of types of first aid and so forth. Uh, okay, I, that might be reasonable. If you're trying to create a kind of a professional organization, uh, you want to, people who are teaching for your organization and your organization's name, you want to be sure they have a, a certain qualification. But outside of that, I mean, there's really no purpose for anybody else, uh, except that it's an income stream and I guess it makes people feel good. But I, I think there are a lot of poisonous effects as well, yeah. Well, we, we can criticize the IGI or the, the, the other major organizations for giving diplomas to people that are so hungry to get them. It's, yeah. it, the problem is not within the Aikikai or the Yoshinkan or whoever else. The problem is with the, the Aikido community. People, <laughs> yeah, well, I've That's been true. a senior teacher in Ireland for, for a while. And in time, I understood that most people actually wanted from me rank, not teaching. Well, yeah, <laughs> teaching, you know, teaching, yes, yeah. yeah, but from a certain point on, the focus from the learning passion switches to the status. So that uh, another, right. yeah. another, another rank, another one, another one, another one. Yeah. So uh, the right. you guys only feeding this. Uh, it's uh, I don't think they're, they're the culprits. We we are uh, each of us because no no one can say okay enough enough of this. No, well, I, I said it, but not many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's true. That's true. I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, everybody's involved, right? It's two way street. You know, if nobody asks for uh, promotions from the Aikikai, then, uh, you know, of course, the, the, the problem wouldn't exist. I think I had a, this conversation with some person on Facebook. Uh, I was saying that. Um, I was saying that we don't really give out ranks anymore. I mean, the people in our group aren't interested in them. You know, they aren't interested in uh, accruing rank. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's just, it's not, it's not something that's not, we're, we're just not doing. I mean, there, there's there been no formal decision like, uh, okay, you know, no, nobody around here is ever giving out rank again. It's just nobody's really interested in, in our particular group of people who are training together. And uh, the, the person made the argument that the Aikikai required you to give out. And I thought that, that, was a, that was a little odd. I mean, there, oh, yeah. there's a, there is a way you could read the international regulations that would say that you're supposed to be giving out ranks, I guess, because it makes money for the Aikikai. But I, I think that was uh, kind of a misinterpretation of the regulations. And uh, if people, if enough people said no, then there would be no money going to the Aikikai, right? If people said, you know, well, why, why do I, why should I send them 500, 600, a thousand dollars, then, you know, it would stop. Right. It's like the old problem with cocaine, right? It's, is it the supplier or is it, or is it the demand, right? Which one is the problem? And then I guess in the end, it's, 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 uh, it's on both ends, right? Both supply yeah. and demand, right? Now, uh, another interesting topic. I think um, there is much, much talk going on about the current problems within Aikido. Um, mm -hmm. Any observers, both from the outside world of martial arts and within our community, mm -hmm. are calling for a, a larger use of cross training. Cross training yeah. is now seen by many as the means yeah. to save our art, give it uh, new life energy, uh, bring it more in line with the current expectations for a martial arts. But um, what do you think? Is this the way ahead or is it just a cosmetic operation to better compete with combat sports on social media? Well, it depends on what your goals are, right? So, I mean, there's no question if you're going to, if you're going to uh, interact with um, than the mo more modern martial artists today, you know, BJJ, MMA people, uh, then, then you're going to have to expand your horizons technically, right? You, I mean, you, you cannot, 
I mean, and the, the Gracies really prove that uh, to traditional martial artists is that, uh, you know, when they, they, uh, they challenge people, they just took them to the ground, nobody knew what to do on the ground, right? So they, they, they ate everyone alive for the first few years. No, not so much, right? Now, now it's balanced out a little. Everybody, everybody in MMA, for example, acknowledges that you have to have a ground game, right? You can't survive the ground game, right? But uh, then you also have to be able to strike, you have to be able to kick, you have to have an, a, you know, any number of tools or toolbox if you're going to interact in that environment. If you're not going to interact in that environment, then who cares, right? You know, I, I, I have no interest in, in uh, you know, if I, if I went in and went to the ground with a BJJ guy, they, they'd absolutely dominate me. I mean, no question, because I had no idea what I'm doing. Um, and that's okay, right? Because I, that's not really, you know, the focus in my training, so that's fine. Uh, there, there's a thing in, in Aikido uh, where a lot of people say, um, you, you talk to them about what, say, fighting. well, fighting has to be defined, first of all, but so just, let's just see if we're talking about fighting in general, they say, okay, we're not interested in fighting, fighting is not the purpose of, I, not the purpose of Aikido, but I could fight if I really wanted to, and, and a lot of people say something like that, like, I could, you know, you know we're, we're not good at uh, MMA, but we, we could, we could do that if we really wanted to, and, you know, for me, I, I would know you, you can't, you really can't, you, you, you couldn't do that. That's impossible. You, you, you couldn't do that without doing something else. So, um, you know, if you're doing what you're doing, say you're doing Tai Chi and you're doing yoga, well, that's fine, but you shouldn't be claiming to do something else. And that's where the problems arise, right? People make claims that are difficult for them to support. All right, and, and that, that that kind of um, false narrative, I think, is a lot of where Aikido people get into trouble, right? So they, 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 some people might claim to be able to fight, but they're obviously not able to, and they're not not willing to challenge it, right? So then you say, okay, if you're able to step in to step in and do MMA, then why not do it, right? You can go in any place and just just try it out, and uh, and you see what happens. But of course that isn't on most people's radar. And then, um, so, well, yeah, so it goes back to what, what you want to do. I think there has to be a kind of truth in advertising, right? So if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're doing something, uh, if you're saying you're doing something, then you should be doing it. And if you're not doing it, then people will eventually see through it. And that's, yeah. That will be part of your problem. It would be enough to have a, a clear and honest narrative about what you're doing and what are the objectives of what you're doing. That's right. That's right. Which right. apparently so if, if, mm -hmm. is not the case for most Aikido um, no. organizations. And that the narrative is not clear at all. And that's probably that's right. where, uh, the real problem with Aikido popularity or vain in popularity lies. It's yeah. 70 or whatever, 80 years after mm -hmm. almost, it's still very difficult to, to say, what is it and what is it for? Yeah. How do you sell something like that? It's very difficult. And it's not even that it's people can't define Aikido in general. Well, okay, I understand that there are a thousand different people doing a thousand different things, right? That's okay. People have trouble even defining what they themselves are doing as Aikido, right? They, they say, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing this thing. And, uh, you know, it's, maybe it's useful for self-defense, but not really. Uh, and there are a lot of contradictory claims. And I don't I want to criticize it anybody. There are a lot of stupid arguments uh, or, or stupid excuses, right? Uh, there are a lot of, uh, excuses in, that have been used in Aikido for a long time that just don't stand up to uh, logical reasoning, right? So, and when, when people use those arguments and then uh, it's just worse for the martial art because you just, you, you don't, you, you, look, you look like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to call anyone an idiot, but for, for example, there are people who say, um, we, we talk about MMA, for example, they right? say, so, uh, they say, oh, well, Aikido is much too dangerous to be used in MMA. That's why we can't fight in MMA. 
And well, okay, but if you look at the standard MMA rules, everything, virtually everything you do in a standard Aikido class is allowed under the rules. So go try it, right? And, but then of course that doesn't happen. So you're, you're arguing something that is not supportable, right? You're, you're not making a, 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 real, a real argument and then thing, things go south. Right, so people need to be clear about what they're doing and just honest about what they're doing. It's fine. People do kudo. Kudo has zero relation to anything in the real world, right? Nobody hunts with kudo. Nobody goes and fights battles with kudo unless we're going back to the zombie apocalypse <laughs> uh, or something. You know, it, it has it has no usefulness in the real world. But probably more people enjoy kudo than aikido, right? If you look at the number of people practicing kudo in, in Japan, right? Overall. So people just have to be clear about what they're doing and whatever they're doing is fine. I think, you know, you know, if, if they're, if they want to take Aikido and, and take, put it in, uh, in a context in which they can compete in MMA, you know, Hey, more power to, you know, you know, that's, that's great, great for you. You know, yeah, you, you know, you can go out and uh, get a ground game and do, do whatever, you know, update, update your, yourself tactically, whatever for that rule set. Well, I think that's great too. Uh, people have to define what they're doing for themselves. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, I've been training for, what is it, almost almost 50 years now and got the impression for a while already that uh, what Aikido suffers from is arrested development. <laughs> now, while the first two generations of Aikido teachers, uh, Morihei and Kishomaru Weshiba Sensei leading the way. They mm -hmm. created uh, and developed the practice and its methods. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that uh, the third generation in Aikido has been more concerned with reaping the benefits resulting <laughs> from the legacy of their predecessors. And mm -hmm. Even uh, at the Aikikai Hombu Dojo, they seem content with teaching the basics of an art that by now is, is getting crystallized, we could say, no? That's the way it's done. Mm -hmm. pom, pom, pom. And right. this, to me, seems the exact opposite of Moihei uh, Weshiba's Takemusu Aikido. Uh, there's <laughs> not, there's not, there's nothing fresh, nothing new coming out of that. Now, do you, would you expect the fourth of the Weshibas to lead the way to the future, the way his father or his grandfather did? Well, it, it seems that the trend in uh, the Aikikai, both with Tudo Mitsuteru Weshiba and Moritero Weshiba is towards um, homogenization, right? making everything the same and making everything the same along the same very, very simple lines, um, which is okay, you know, if that, that's their approach. Uh, but I don't, I don't think, I don't see, well, Moritiro Mori Ishii was getting older, so he's kind of, I don't want to say he's on his way out. Uh, maybe that's disrespectful, <laughs> but he, he's certainly older. And I think Mitsuhiro Ishii is really, really taking the lead these days. Uh, I don't see him as an innovator, uh, technically, right? I don't, I'm, I don't think he sees himself that way either. Um, the, the real genius, I thought, of Kishimaru Oishiba was that he didn't impose a technical curriculum on anybody, right? Uh, he, he, Kishimaru Oishiba did this kind of neutral, kind of bland, Aikido, right? And um, he didn't tell anybody to do anything. He didn't say do it this way. He prohibit people from doing anything, right? There were people like Shoji Nishio or Morihiro Saito, right? And they did their their own things. Uh, even Kuichi Tohe probably could have done exactly what he did if he hadn't been doing it at Aikikai Hombu and trying to make that the main uh, main style of Aikido. So he was kind of neutral and that allowed the Aikikai to become the largest organization, right? Because it included all kinds of different practice. Uh, Mitsuo Ishiba and Moritero Ishiba seem to be trying to homogenize things more 
Um, they don't, I mean, the, there's there there is still no mandate you know, from the ITKI Act technically, uh, but there seems to be something within the ITKI that the, all the teachers now are kind of the same, right? I mean, when when I went 1982 to ITKI Hombo Dojo, you had Sateru Arikawa and you had Nobuyoshi uh, Watanabe Sensei were just completely different. And you had, you know, Tada Sensei, if he was there from Italy, and uh, you had, uh, you know, Seiko Yamaguchi Sensei, and you, you had all these different teachers with very different styles, right? You had Morihiro Saito out in Iwama, and you, know, you had uh, these, these different approaches that were all kind of under the umbrella of the Aikai. I think now, today, if you go to the IKEA, the teachers are all kind of similar. Um, I guess there are benefits to that too, right? Uh, but I don't see Mitsuteru's innovating very much. There are some real innovators in the early days, right? Shoji Nishio was a real, a real innovator, right? You know, he, he went out and added in all kinds of different things. Yoshio Kuroya right, would add it in his boxing movements. Um, I don't think that would that'll happen in the Aikai. And the question is going to be going forward whether the Aikai will permit that to occur as before. They have no real leverage. So they have no way to forbid that from happening. But I think there there will be more and more pressure from the Aikai to standardize, right, to keep things homogenous um, uh, going along the same lines, which is as an organization, I can understand why they would do that, but I think it's kind of a, a shame in Aikido in that this kind of a big tent art uh, in the beginning, um, you know, through the uh, through the early post-war period, and uh, has so many really very talented and different practitioners. Um, that's one of the reasons why I really dislike what the Aikikai uh, did to Shodokan Aikido and Tomiki Aikido. Right, because the, the the language in the Aikai and, and in Aikido in general is always about inclusiveness. Right, they they say, well, it's about the world family. Oh, you know, we're all, all a world Aikido family, but not those guys, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> they do something else. That's not Aikido, right? Yeah, so, I mean, wouldn't it be interesting if they could say, well, okay, you know, in you know, we we believe that Aikido should be done this, this way, but uh, what those guys are doing is also Aikido. So it's all joined together in one world span uh overall umbrella organization where everybody can get together and meet wouldn't that be interesting but i i, I doubt that will happen because uh, well for reasons of power and authority and of course probably income as well right uh, so I, I don't see that coming and that's similar to what happens among religions too right you don't see that the catholic church and the uh, other churches joining back with other churches, with the Baptist church and the Methodist church, even though everybody talks about the brotherhood of man and so forth and so on. I mean, wouldn't it be interesting if everybody could get together? But uh, I, you know, I see that as kind of a dim, dim possibility. But the, the advantage of that, of course, is that it would allow for you know, great innovation, space for innovation and recognition that innovation is okay. Um, I guess there needs to be a common ground somewhere where we meet. And in, interestingly, uh, Kenji Tomiki's idea was that that common ground would be competition, right? That the competition would be the thing that drew the Aikido world together. Because um, you look at Taekwondo, for example, which is a world spanning Olympic martial art, right? And um, no matter what crazy stuff anybody does in any school anywhere in the world, they all have to get together in competition because they all have to compete against the same, under the same rule set. So there's one space of common ground where everybody gets together no matter what, because everybody's agreed on this rule set and we all compete together under that rule set. You may hate the rule set. That's okay, 90% of the time you can do something else, but when at some point you're gonna have to get together with all the other Taekwondo dojos and compete under that rule set. And Kenji Tomiki kind of hoped uh, his, his, one of his hopes was that uh, competitive Aikido would bring people together uh, in that one space, because there's really nothing that unites us, right? Uh, our philosophies are all kind of all over the place and our practices are all over the place and we disagree about this and this and that. So where, where are we gonna get together? I think the Oishiba family would like it to be around the Oishiba family, 
for obvious reasons, right? But I don't, I don't think that's going to happen anymore. Uh, they don't have the, you know, the prestige and the pull or the, the authority to do that. And, uh, you know, so what else is, is there, there's a philosophy that people don't really agree on. Uh, there's a technical curriculum that people don't really agree on. There are goals that people don't really agree on. So there's really no common ground for everyone to come together. Uh, unless everybody were to accept some kind of, some kind of competitive venue, that people could unite under, and it wouldn't even have to be a, a sporting competition. You know, uh, figure skaters compete in a common U, right? And they don't compete directly against each other, so they're not. It's not like boxing where they're striking and and uh, hurting each other. People are really opposed to that. Uh, there, there are different kinds of competition, so may, maybe that's something that could happen in the future. I don't see it happening anytime soon, certainly. Well, um, my last my last question, Chris. Um, Aikido and traditional Budo in general are experiencing a, a strong vocation crisis worldwide. Um, in your opinion, can Aikido effectively relocate itself within the realm of the relas relational? without completely losing its uh, martial edge. But more to the point, is any good, Aikido any good as a conflict resolution method once it loses its uh, martial edge? Mm. Well, that's it's a difficult, uh, that's a difficult we, we topic. Also, um, we're not interested in the beating, in fighting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Aikido is good because of A, B, C, D. Right, right. But the yeah, way yeah. to make it good, it has always been the martial training. So my question really yeah. is, in your opinion, with time going by and the martial edge going lower and lower and lower and lower, yeah. is, is Aikido any good, even at relational? <laughs> Well, I would say, well, good is kind of, is a, is a value judgment. So uh, that, that's a difficult judgment. I think that traditionally, um, Aikido always, even, even if it wasn't actually used for fighting, uh, when I started or any time in the post-war, all the, the first generation of teachers assumed that there was an element of effectiveness as a Budo, as a martial art, right? Uh, and that was that was part of the the package and the assumption. Part of the package was that martial training was part of the personal training, right? This let's say spiritual or sociological training uh, was that that martial the martial training was an element in that. Whether it's that element of conflict or that element of danger or that element of intensity that's brought about by martial art training, that was uh, an essential part of the training, right? Something that you could you couldn't put away and then have to have the same thing. Um, so I think an argument could be said that once you lose the martial edge, it, it really becomes something else, right? Uh, now that something else might be better. I don't know, right? It might be worse. It might be yoga, it might be interpretive dance and maybe it'll be more popular. I, I, don't, I don't know. So that's for people to judge. Uh, but I, I think there, are, there is also an argument to be made that once you lose a martial, that martial edge, even, even if it's not applicable to uh, martial reality, then like changing what you're doing. So for, for example, um, you, you can look at martial arts that have no application to reality, right? Uh, a lot of the Koryu, right? So if you look at, if you look at Ritsuke Otake, when he, he did uh, Katori Shintoryu and when he was training with Naginata and Spear, you know, nobody's going to fight with Naginata and Spear anymore, right? That's never going to happen. So there's no connection to reality for his training, but his training was also very martial, right? There was, there was a kind of reality to it, I guess, that gave it that edge. And you could, you could argue that it's that edge that gives it the power to, That's it. if we're if we're saying to transform people or to have an effect on no people. martial edge would actually translate into no intent or little intent and little power. 
Yeah, perhaps. I mean, that, that argument could be made. I mean, that's not saying that anything that came out of that would be worse if there were no martial edge to it. I mean, it, it would be different, certainly. So that, that's always, there's always a question when you change things. And I think I've had this discussion with some people about um, marketing in Aikido, right? So, you know, you know, there's been some very good material that's come out uh, recently about uh, uh, marketing, marketing martial arts dojos and uh, marketing Aikido. And um, there have been some surveys conducted about that. And uh, I think that's great, right? Because people definitely, if you're running Aikido and you need to pay the bills, then you need to do some marketing, right? If you're paying rent. Uh, but um, I, I also feel that you have to be cautious when you change things for marketing purposes. Because I know I've, I've spoken to people who say, okay, well, Aikido should be presented as more of a, well, you know, more as a group a group exercise activity, right? Because that's the surveys show that's what people really want. They want more of a kind of a group yoga or something like that. And they, that's probably true, right? It's probably what people want. Um, and, and I think you have to be careful about that because as, as you change those things, you also change what you're doing, right? Eventually what you're doing. And then you end up with something different, which is not bad, right? Something different might be great, might be better, as I said, it might be worse, who knows? But it's certainly something different. So if, if we're trying to preserve something, and we, we don't know what it is, because we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't agree on what uh, martial arts are, and so forth. Uh, but I think, think it's very easy to argue that that sense of martial training is, is something that's essential to certainly what Murihe Oishiba was doing. I think he felt that uh, Aikido was Buddha, right? There was always a, a martial aspect, right? Uh, Kishimoto Ushiba, I think, also felt the same way. Uh, Moritiro Ushiba, I'm not sure, right? I'm not sure how he feels about that. Moritiro and Mitsutero, I'm not sure that it's still even on their radar anymore uh, as an effective Buddha. Uh, it may be, I don't, I don't want to speak for them. Uh, but I think that's certainly kind of disappearing. So it's certainly going to change, and, you know, whether that's a good thing or not, you know, who could tell? Yeah, but I mean, it, 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 you know, it's very easy to argue that Budo uh, brings intensity. The, the only negative aspect in a modern world is that you have to separate the intensity of your Budo training. Say, if you're doing Naginata, it should be martial, it should be intense, it should be focused. Uh, but at the same time, you have to realize that Naganata has no relation to the real world, right? So, you know, it doesn't, being, uh, you know, the world's deadliest person with a Naginata. Uh, doesn't make you a fighter, right? It's not going to put you in an MMA ring and you know and bring you bring you success, except that except that you're in you know you have a certain focus and intensity. So it, because Aikido is kind of a an empty hand art, right? Uh, those things are very easily mixed together. Right? So I say, well, I'm practicing intensely martially. Well, then that becomes mixed in with arguments for effectiveness and real world application, which may or may not be applicable. Right, it's because someone can practice very Aikido, just standard old, regular Aikido. Say uh, Kazuo Chiba, right? It was very intense. Right, he very, very had a very martial practice. Right, um, would, would he do okay? Would, would he do okay with a BJJ guy? He'd probably get his ass handed to him, right? Because he doesn't, he's not familiar with that, you know, with, with that paradigm. He's not used to working under that rule set. So you know, it's important that we separate those things. Yeah, and that, again, going back to what we spoke to before, there's a problem that people think if they're training very mostly, therefore they are effective martial artists or they're effective fighters, right? But they're there. That's a different. That's a different thing. Right? Okay, uh, I think we reached the end of this interview. Uh, Chris, thanks a lot for for this great conversation and for sharing your. Thank your you very much. With us. Um, also, thank you very much for everyone that got uh, connected. We hope that you enjoyed this session as much as we, we did. And in, during next week, I will have a video on YouTube and also I'll produce the transcription of, of it. It's a lot of work, so... Uh, Probably more of me than people want to see. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
I, I enjoyed it. That, that's it. <laughs> I don't care. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it as well. Uh, before closing, I, I would like to remind you that uh, we're going to be back next Sunday. Uh, that's the 28th. And we're going to host Andre Cognard. The session will start at 1 p.m. Uh, English time or 2 p.m. for whoever is connected uh, from Italy. Um, one final word. Uh, if you can, please contribute with a donation to keep our, our work going. And donate buttons are available on, on our webpage. Um, also, um, at the bottom of each article that we publish uh, weekly. Thank you no, very nobody much. Nobody gets rich doing this stuff, so. No, not at all. <laughs> at, the, at, the, at the most, I know donations pay for like server time and maybe that's a small fraction of the time you put in, so. That, that's what we would like to try and get, and <laughs> to get some support in paying our expenses, okay? Yeah. Chris, thanks a million. Arrivederci. And talk to you again. Bye bye, Thank everybody. You very much. Thank you.